اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم But there is only one place in the Quran, one place, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the distribution of the zakat in Surah Tawbah. إِنَّمَا السَّدَقَاتُ لِلْفُقَرَاءِ وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَالْعَمِلِينَ عَلَيْهَا وَالْمُؤَلَّفَةُ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَفِي الْدِقَاءِ وَالْغَالِمِينَ وَفِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَفِي السَّبِيلِ In Surah Tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the distribution of zakat and he mentions about who are eligible to receive the zakat. Who should be receiving the zakat? Only one place in the Quran. How many people do you think are eligible to receive zakat? Do you know? Who do we give zakat to? Poor people. So poor people is one category. Under that category comes everybody who is poor, whether they are orphans, widows. Everybody who you think is poor comes under that category. This is one category. Who else? Yes, sir. Those that are new to the deen. Those that are new to the deen. New to the deen, I'll take that and I'll explain in a moment. That's two categories. Who else? Sorry? That's, that, that's if they're poor people. So poor and needy is two categories, poor and needy. And then those we need to reconcile the heart with, that's three categories. Anyone? Travelers. Travelers. Again, I'll explain what that means. Four, that's four already. Not all travelers, but I'll explain, I'll explain in a moment. Who else? Less fortunate. That comes under four and me. In total, Allah mentioned about eight categories of zakat recipients. Eight. Poor and needy, what's the difference between them? Well, one is the one who's got nothing at all. He's got nothing. And the other one is somebody who's got something, he might have like a little, uh, let's say 100 pounds. But how are you going to survive with 100 pounds in this big city of London? You, you will not be able to survive. So this is the difference between poor and needy. Then you have those who administrate the zakat in the time of the Prophet for example, and through the, the, the history of Islam. The Prophet for example, sent Mu'ad ibn Jabal to Yemen. And he told him that when you go there, you preach people towards Islam, etc. And you collect the zakat from them and you distribute it as well. These were known as the administrators of zakat. In the time of the Prophet during the time of the Quran, etc. It wasn't about people as soon as they had to pay zakat and then they just go around and find somebody who's poor and give him zakat. No, it wasn't like that. That came later. In the, time, in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, this was an affair of the state. The state would collect the zakat and the state was in charge to distribute the zakat according to the needs of the society. Because these people, they were doing this as a 9 to 5 job and they had no time to go elsewhere to find another job, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed these people to take from this zakat a wage to pay for themselves. He allowed them to take the zakat money to pay themselves a wage. That is three categories. Then you have one category is those that you need to reconcile the heart with. In the time of the Prophet ﷺ, they were people, especially for example, after the conquest of Makkah, many people at that time, they entered into Islam out of fear. They entered into Islam out of fear. So the Prophet ﷺ and Sahabi into Makkah out of fear they embraced Islam. And one of them did not embrace Islam at all. For example, Safwan bin Umayyah radiallahu anhu who wasn't Muslim then at that time. They had this misconception that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is just here and with his Sahaba, they're going to come and they're going to take over everything, they're going to take our wealth, they're going to take everything. They still had hatred in their hearts. In reality, they still had hatred in their hearts with Islam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa especially straight after that in the battle of Hunayn, to show them that there is no reason to hate us. We're not here to take anything. Through the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ, after the battle of Qudayn, when they gathered the money of him and all the wealth that they won in the battle, he called those people the new Muslim. They called, he called the new Muslim and he called Safwan who was a Muslim at that time. And he said, what is it? You like these things? You like the camel? You like the wealth? Then take it. And he would give it to them. He would give it to them and he kept on giving to them to the point that the Ansar the Ansar, they thought that the Prophet ﷺ has stopped loving them and he started to love the 
you are Muslim more than them. They started to get worried. They went and then Shikaya, they went to complain to the Prophet Ya Rasulullah, he said to them, why are you worried about it? These people, the new Muslim, and they still have the love for this dunya, etc. Don't you prefer that they take away all the wealth and you, you don't get any wealth. But what is it that you take away in return? You take me away. The Sahaba, they say, of course we want to take you away. We don't want anything. We don't need it. These are those people that the Prophet Sallallahu had to reconcile the heart with, bring them closer to Islam. The Prophet Sallallahu was told through Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in this verse that those that needed to bring closer to Islam, you can spend zakat on them. And the Prophet Sallallahu he would spend wealth on those leaders, the tribes, leaders, etc. to bring people closer to Islam. Whether this category still exists or not today, the ulama, they have differed, they have differed about it. This is fourth category. Fifth category is those who are in bondage, the slaves. Spend zakat on them to bring them out of slavery. Spend zakat on those who are in debt. They have more debt than asset. They're completely thrown in debt. Spend zakat on them. Even there, the, the, the ulama, they have deferred as to what kind of debt we're talking about. Does it mean like somebody is gamble and he's gone into debt, can you give zakat to him? The ulama, they have deferred on that. We're not going to talk about that at the moment. Then you have those who are fighting in the past of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, the ulama, they have differed. Can it be extended to those who call towards Islam, etc. And then finally, you have those that the brother mentioned, the traveler, the wayfarer. For example, a person is in the UK. He's got one million pounds, for example. Just to give you an idea, a better understanding of what we're talking about here. A person, let's say he's a, he's a millionaire here in the UK. He travels to Brazil and he gets stuck there in the forest. And then he loses his credit card, his bank card, his money, his ticket, everything. He's got nothing on himself and he cannot return to the UK. He needs help. It is allowed to spend zakat on this person to bring it back to the UK. This is what we call it in the city. Eight categories of zakat recipient and you had noticed that not every one of them is related to poverty. Not every one of them is related to poverty. If zakat was related about poverty, if zakat was just about poverty allegation, then why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala differentiate between zakat and sadaqah? Even sadaqah as well is for poverty allegation. Why would it differentiate for? Why would it restrict zakat to only eight categories of people and then sadaqah he makes it open to everyone? Why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala call zakat a pillar of Islam? Sadaqah is not a pillar of Islam. If both of them are about poverty allegation, then why? What's so special about the zakat? Because we all know that this Islam has been built upon five pillars, and one of the pillars is zakat. So how is Islam, the establishment of Islam is connected to zakat? Imam Tabari, Rahmatullahi alayhi shafi'i scholar, one of the greatest mufassir, greatest commentator of the Quran, he says that when you look at the eight categories of zakat recipient, you realize one thing. What is it that you realize? That the zakat is for two purposes. Two purposes. Zakat is to fulfill the needs of the individuals. For example, you give zakat to the poor and needy. Why? To fulfill his needs. You give zakat to the administrator of zakat, you pay them a wage. Why? It's for his needs. You pay zakat to the one who's in debt, who's in debt, that is for his need. You pay zakat to the wayfarer who's stuck somewhere else, it's for his need. The slave, you're going to free him from slavery, why? For his need. Six categories of zakat recipients, they are related to the individual needs. But two of them, those we need to reconcile the heart with, and those who are fighting the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, two of them, Imam Tabari, they say that this Categories, they're related to the protection of Islam. They're related to what? To the protection of Islam. When the Prophet ﷺ, he spent zakat on certain of those people that he needed to reconcile the heart with, he was to protect the Muslim as well against those people. So he's for the protection of Islam. Coming back to these six categories that I mentioned, fulfilling the needs of the individual. Why do we actually have to fulfill the needs for? Why would you want to give zakat to a poor person? Can anyone tell me? Why do you give zakat to a poor person? Yes, brother. To improve their state of 
to improve their state of life? No. To? Same. Same. What else? Yes, sir. Because they have no money. Because they have no money, but why? Why do we want to help them? Why would we want to have the poor, the needy? Why would we want to have the zakat collector? Why would we want to have the one who's in slavery? Why? Why do we want to do that? For? Any idea? To? Part of Islam. But even sadaqah as well is part of Islam. You see, if helping them was connected to generosity, if this was all about generosity, then even non-Muslims as well are generous. Even non-Muslims as well spend into charity. Does that mean they are establishing Islam now? They are not establishing Islam. So why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala call zakat a pillar of Islam? If zakat is just about being generous. Yes, brother? Can I say the clue is on the billboard outside? The clue is on the billboard outside. I didn't see the billboard outside. outside. You see, Imam Kasani, Rahmatullah alayhi, great Hanafi scholar. He says that when you pay zakat to a poor person, when you pay zakat to a poor person, it's not just about you helping him and taking out of poverty. You need to think beyond that. You're going to bring him out of poverty to bring him back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to give him a chance to turn for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a hadith in Sahih the Hibban according to the meaning of the hadith. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that if there is one thing, if there is one thing that is very close to take somebody to kufr, that is very close to take somebody to disbelief, that thing would be fakr, that thing would be poverty. Today, how many people have sold their iman, have sold their deen because of poverty? How many people have done that? How many people have turned away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of their financial situation? Today people, they are drawn in debt. I've seen a brother recently, just before Ramadan, he's drawn in debt to the point that sometimes in the week he does 24 hours security shift. 24 hours security shift. When a person he works like that, 24 hours security shift, 15 hours, 16 hours, because he needs money, then how much time is he going to give for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How much time is he going to give? When a person is stressed, then how is he going to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The ulama, they say, ultimately, Imam Qasani said, when you spend zakat on the poor, is to bring that person back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to give him that chance. When you understand that, that paying zakat to fulfill the need of the individual is to give the chance to people to come back to Islam. And when you understand that zakat is also for the protection of Islam, then you will understand that zakat is there to establish an environment where Islam can flourish. When you understand that much, then you understand why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that Islam has been built upon five pillars and one of that pillar is the zakat. Because zakat and Islam is connected together. This is what zakat is like. Unfortunately, it is really sad that we have forgotten about this. We have forgotten about this. And we have allowed many misconceptions to enter into our day. Especially when it comes to the zakat. I mentioned earlier, people who think paying zakat taxes to the Yukon government is equivalent to paying the zakat, they don't pay zakat there. Many people believe the zakat is connected to charity and because they have the habit of giving into charity throughout the year, then I mean, they don't need to give zakat anymore. Unfortunately, it has become like that. Zakat ultimately is for Islam. And this is what National Zakat Foundation has made the vision about starting from this year's vision. To spend the zakat in a way that is there to fulfill the needs of the individual and it is also there to build Islam. It is also there to help Islam to flourish. How are you going to achieve that? How are you going to achieve that? First of all, you need to pull out the zakat together. Just like in the time of the Prophet the Khulafa, etc. The zakat used to be pulled together. Zakat wasn't about every individual giving money away just like that on their own. It wasn't about that. Zakat needs to be spent locally. The ulama they have agreed 
that zakat is something that needs to be spent locally. Yes, if there is a greater need elsewhere, then you can send your zakat elsewhere. But primary zakat was something that needed to be spent locally. And you need, so this is the two components. And then the third one is that you need the zakat to be spent across these categories. Now you're going to ask me, so that means it's haram to send zakat to God? Or does it mean that it's haram to give zakat on my own if I want to give? No, it's not haram. You have to understand one thing. One is being halal and haram. And one is doing what is best. Having a strategy. Imam Qutubi, Malik scholar, Rahmatullah is commentator, commentator of the Quran. When he explained the word Ummah, we call ourselves Ummah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he explained that word, he said that if a group of people, if a group of people, they do not share a common objective, they do not have a single direction, then they are not worth to be called an Ummah. They're not worth to be called an Ummah. Sadly, the state of the Muslim nowadays is that, as you all know, we all have different direction. We all have different direction. An Ummah is, some, is a group of people that need to have a strategy. We need to have a strategy. This is what Islam wants. This is throughout the history of the, the Prophet ﷺ. He always had strategy in his mind. He never used to do things just like that for the sake of it. He need to have a strategy in place. What is halal and haram is one thing. To do something better is another thing. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. A simple example. If somebody he prays, he five times salah a day. He prays his five times salah in a day. And he says, me, I'm too lazy to pray sunnah. I'm too lazy to pray witr or whatever. Does it mean his five times salah is not valid anymore? His five times salah is still valid. You can't say to that person. Unfortunately, I don't know. Recently, we came across a sister who just reverted. She literally just reverted. And somebody might have scared her and said to her, if you don't pray your witr, all your namaz in the day is not valid. And she just reverted two weeks ago. <laughs> Try already to... And she... Reverted, and this is very important, remember that. She reverted because and she got kicked out of her house by her parents. And this person came to National Zakat Foundation to seek help because she's got nowhere to go. This is what people they think that there's no poverty, there's nothing like that in the UK. Then what about those people who got kicked out of their houses because they embrace Islam? She literally got kicked out of her house, she get her help, and somebody said, if you don't pray with the namaz, all your salah is not valid. One thing is praying five times salah a day. However, a Muslim is better for him that he prays his sunnah during the day. It's better for him to he prays his witr and his nawafi. This is the same thing. Zakat is something you want to send to the world, send to the world. You want to give it on your own, give it on your own. But what about if we had a strategy in mind for the collective, for everybody? What about if we have that in mind? Then that would be better. And this is what the Zakat Foundation is trying to achieve. Before I move on to calculation, I'm going to take any question that you may have about distribution. Do you have any question about what I spoke or who should we be giving zakat to, etc. Do you have any question related to that? And anything related to calculation, I will do that in a moment. Is it true that only the relatives that are extremely needy should be considered first? Yes. This hadith, I think in Sahih Muslim, if I'm not wrong, it's an authentic hadith, Sahih hadith. The Prophet ﷺ informed us that when you give any form of charity, whether it's salafah, whether it's salafah, whether it's, whether it's salafah, zakat, it doesn't matter. When you give it to a person who is among your relative and who is eligible to receive zakat, then you will get two rewards. You get two rewards. One reward is the reward of giving the salafah or giving the reward of the zakat. The other reward is because you are strengthening the family ties. So that's why you get two rewards when you give it to a poor relative, and that is the best thing to do. Because when you don't give, you see what I mentioned earlier, I just mentioned about giving zakat as a collective, etc. You also have to realize one thing. If you have family members who are eligible to receive zakat, your first option is to give them the zakat. Your first option is to give them the zakat. Your second option is, no, you give it elsewhere. Whether you think I'll give it abroad, this and that, etc. However, you have to remember one thing. If they are your family members, or if they are your neighbors, 
you are still going to be held accountable for not helping them if you do not help them at all. Because if you have a neighbor, you have to certain rights to fulfill towards him. Whether you pay zakat to him or not, it doesn't matter. But if you know your neighbor is in need, you need to put every effort that you can to, to help him. Similarly, if you know your brother is in need, if you want to give him zakat, it's fine. But if you don't want to give him zakat, you give it elsewhere, it's fine. However, you still have a right to fulfill towards him because he's your relative. Talking about your relatives, who can we give zakat to amongst the relatives? You can give zakat to any brothers and sisters, any uncle and aunties, your cousin brothers, cousin sisters, nephew, nieces, you can give them zakat. You can give zakat to all your in-laws, father-in-law, mother-in-law, etc. But you cannot give zakat to your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents and all the ascendants. Similarly, you cannot give zakat to your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, etc. All the descendants. You can't give them zakat. Why? Because you have to fulfill their rights in the first place. You have to provide for them. Can a wife give zakat to the husband? And can the husband give zakat to the wife? The ulama, they agree that the husband cannot give zakat to the wife. Because it is his duty to provide for the wife. Can the wife give zakat to the husband? According to the Hanafi school of jurisprudence, that is not permissible either. According to the other school of jurisprudence, it is, it is permissible. Any other question about the solution? Yes, brother. When we give our zakat, uh, should we follow up and request to know where the zakat has actually got to its end destination? As in, can I see where my zakat has gone? Can I request to... It is... To see. You will not be able to know who received it. But as in, which project, which... You can see. It's very difficult. It depends after that. I cannot speak about every charity. But it depends because, for example, with National Zakat Foundation, all the zakat come into one pot. So after that, we know that 75% will go towards fulfilling the needs of the individual. We know that 15% of it will go towards feasibility in that and wise and you know, reconciliating the heart, etc. We call that social cohesion and uh, community development. 15% goes towards that. And then 10% goes towards the salary of those who work, who are we call the uh, case workers, meaning they process the application of the zakat, um, zakat applicants. This is how it's divided, but to know exactly where, for example, your 100 pounds is going is very difficult to, to know that, especially if you have like southern, southern donors. But, and everything goes into one point. Do you understand? So every zakat collected goes into one pot and then from that one pot it gets distributed according to these needs. So for example, if I give someone a hundred pounds to alleviate their debt, yeah. must I ensure that their debt is definitely alleviated by that hundred pounds and they don't spend it elsewhere? No. You cannot make a condition first of all when you give some zakat to somebody. For example, you can't say to somebody, I give you my zakat but you have to buy food. If you want to say that to him, that's up to you. But he doesn't have to follow you. He doesn't have to. Because for the validity of this zakat payment, the transfer of ownership must be established between the donor and the recipient. So once you give your zakat to somebody, that person becomes owner of your money. Once he's become owner, he can do whatever he wants with the money. That's what the ulama they have said. That if at that moment he used that zakat money to make food and call you and feed you from it, it's halal for you. Because that money is not zakat anymore, that is his own money. So, if you give zakat to, pay, to somebody to pay for his debt, if he doesn't want to use it for his debt, then that, that is not, how do you call it, that doesn't matter. However, one thing we have to mention is that if you know that if you're going to give zakat to somebody, and you know that person, he's going to use that zakat money to do something haram. For example, you know somebody is a gambler, and you know if you give him that money, he's going to gamble with it. You shouldn't be giving him zakat. Yes, sir. There is a possibility that if you give somebody the money, and they have hidden habits like taking drugs, and that money will go towards the drugs without your knowledge. But yeah. They have these hidden habits that they do take. So that, as far as you're concerned, it's gone right, but obviously it's yes. misused. Yes, it's misused, but your zakat is valid. Your zakat is valid. In fact, 
when you give zakat to somebody who to your best of knowledge you thought that this person is eligible to receive zakat that's why you don't have to go and ask somebody show me what you got in your bank account you don't have to do that from what you hear and what you see to your best of knowledge you know you can make a judgment whether somebody is poor or needy or not after that if you give that person the zakat even if that person wasn't eligible even if later on you find out, you discover that, you know what, this guy, he had money at home. Your zakat is still valid, you do not need to re-give your zakat. Yes, you will not give him in the future, but you do not need to re your zakat. Any other question about this question? Food, rather than the ulama, they have different about that, but the, in the Hanafi school of jurisprudence is you can give something else instead of money. As long as the thing is tangible and they can be made owner of it. So for example, you can buy a parcel of food and give to the person. So if you think that your zakat money is going to be misused, then maybe buy the food for example. Buy a parcel of food, buy clothing or whatever give to the person. But you cannot cook food and call a person to come and eat. That is not the same. Because then you haven't made an order of it. The owner this is that's not the same. Yes. Somebody, for example, asked, asked you for money, they said in a bit of hardship, for example, their paycheck hasn't come and they've not been paid and they ask you for money and you give it to them, but they, they ask you in the preface that saying, I'm going to give it back to you. You didn't ask them to say that. If they'd have just said to you, can you help me out, you would have given them anyway, like the cat. But they've said to you, they're going to pay you back. And then they disappear after they've asked and you've given it and they've said they're going to pay you back. You say, okay. You was waiting for them to call you to say, you don't need to pay me back, it's all right, but they never actually give you the call. What is that? I, 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 no, because if that person has said, give me some money, help me out, I'll pay you back, then that is not zakat money, that is you giving them a loan. Okay. Yeah? If that person doesn't pay you back after that, yeah. then it's finished. Either you forgive the person, and then Allah gives you the reward for it, or either you know you wait, like once a brother, he said to me, do I pay zakat on money that is owed to me? I said, well, if you still have hope, then you need to pay zakat on it. He said, yeah, my hope. Go on the bed. I said, how much percentage you have hope? He said, 99 percent. I have no hope that person is going to pay me back. I said, so why is, do you have that 0.1 percent hope? He said to me, well, so that on the day of judgment, if he doesn't pay me on the day of judgment, I'm going to take him to Allah's power with armor. He said, this guy didn't pay me my four thousand pound. And then he said to me, on the day of judgment, every little help, right? So that's why he doesn't want to forgive that person completely. Does he work for Tesco's? I don't know that. <laughs> he watches to work that advertisement. Yes, brother. Yes. Yeah. If someone who is poor and needy, like uh, he's aged, like 80 years old, and he cannot work, but he has uh, 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 yeah, some piece of land in his ownership. If he sell it, he can earn a lot of money. Uh, he is not selling. But without selling, he cannot get the food. Does he live on that land? Yeah, he live on land. That, that he cannot earn that much money that he can he can spend for the whole year. He doesn't have to sell that land. And uh, can can you give the zakat to them or not? Yes. Okay. You see, for somebody to be eligible to receive zakat in the Hanafi school. That person must not have, first of all, his zakatable asset, his zakatable asset meaning gold, cash, everything you pay zakat on, must not reach the nisab. It must be below the nisab. And secondly, his non zakatable asset, his non zakatable asset must not be in extra. What does that mean? You don't pay zakat on your personal car, that is necessity. You do not pay zakat on your own house, that is necessity of life. You do not pay zakat on your own land you live in, that is your necessity. However, if you have extra, so you, instead of having one car, you have two cars for the sake of it. You have one house you live in, but you have an extra house for the sake of it. The Ahnaf said, you need to tell that person, sell that extra asset and then pay, leave up that money before you are eligible to receive zakat. So if that person lives on his own land, it doesn't matter, that is personal land, he doesn't need to sell it. Agricultural land, agricultural land, there is a lot of agricultural land, 
Is it growing? Uh, yeah. But they cannot fulfill the necessities of life. So if you cannot fulfill his necessities of life, then you can pay him. Is that right? Like the person is living in his home. Yeah. And he has one acre area of the land, and he has given it to someone who grew the crops on over there. For him? For who? For him and give some money to the back of the landlord. But he's still not, he's not, he's yes, still I mean, unable to live. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, then he's eligible to visit Zakat, of course. It's not, it's not important to sell the... No, no, no. Yes. Some private school, Islamic school, collect the money from the people. Say we're going to bring the mothers on this and that. Uh, after that, they stop charging money for it. So they use Zakat money to build the middle cell. First of all, using Zakat to build the madrasa is probably not permissible in the Hanafi fiqh. Because you do not make anybody all out of that money. You're building a building for everybody to come and use. So that doesn't make sense to me in the first place. No. Yes. The hospital is slightly different because the hospital, as far as I know, as far as I'm talking about the hospital that approached me and to ask me about it, they collect the zakat fund, they collect zakat fund, and then those poor people who come and need treatment and surgery, the, tre the, the zakat fund is used for their treatment. Yes? But the person will, so the fund is kept separate, first of all, and those who are eligible to receive it, they will sign an agreement to say that I'm allowing the hospital to use the money on my behalf. I'm allowing them to use my money on that behalf and then there is no problem. We do the same thing at National Zakat Foundation. I'll give you a very simple example. We have homeless people in London. Now if somebody comes and applies for help with us and then he goes and find, for example, maybe we're going to put him into a hotel room in the first few nights until he finds somewhere where to stay. Now we're not going to give him the money because again, how do we know that he's going to use that money to pay the room, hotel rent, etc. However, we're going to pay the hotel directly and then we're going to pay the landlord directly. Now, the landlord is not eligible to receive zakat. Landlord or the hotel is not eligible to receive zakat. But the recipient has given permission for, money, for his money on, to be spent on his behalf. That's what happens in the hospital. So the ownership, there is a transfer of ownership. The ownership is transferred to the recipient, but the recipient gave permission to the hospital to use the money on their behalf and that there is no problem with that. But to use it directly is problematic. Like in this case of the school you're telling me about, they use the money to build up the school. That I do not know. Then where is the transfer of ownership? Yes, sir. I think this question is. One question. I am doing business, for example, mobile phone shop. Yeah. I have more than two, three mobiles, which are for selling, but uh, for one year, they are not going to sell. Okay. Is eligible for uh, going, giving uh, the car on the app? As long as you have the hope, as long as you are, this is still part of your stock, the business stock, you still want to sell them, you have to pay the car. Whatever value you please. Even if it's dead stock, even if it's dead stock, whatever the value is, you pay the car. Uh, seven gram gold, you don't have to pay zakat. If you have seven grams, you don't pay zakat. Maybe seven dollars. Maybe seven dollars. Yes, seven dollars, it makes sense, not seven grams. Seven dollars is about. 96 grams of uh, whatever of zakat. This, the, 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 the nisab is around 88 grams of gold. Yeah, so that's why you have seven dollars, it makes sense. Yeah.
So you are, you will be paying zakat. You're not gonna receive zakat. No, no. The lady said that you don't have to pay zakat. Yes, yeah, so more than that. Yeah, yeah. No, but then it depends. It depends. You have to understand one thing. One is if a person has got gold only as asset, and the other one is if you have gold and cash together, which is the case of the majority of the people. So our ladies, they receive gold when they got married. Most likely they also have cash. On their zakat day, you must all have a zakat anniversary date, I presume. You all know have a zakat anniversary date, yeah? If you don't have it, then you need to choose a date. In the Islamic calendar, it must be fixed. Whatever day that is, 10 of Muharram, 15 of Shaban, whatever that is, you must fix it based on the Islamic calendar. On the day itself, you're going to look at how much gold and how much cash you have. Now, maybe you have 1,000 pound worth of cash and you only have 100 pound worth of gold. Only 100 pound worth of gold. 100 pound worth of gold is maybe three dollars it's only three dollars maybe you will still have to pay zakat <coughs> why because you're gonna say i have one thousand pound plus three dollar of gold which is roughly around uh four four hundred pounds or something like that five hundred pound maybe so you're gonna be once you're gonna add one thousand up to five hundred that's 1500 pound and you're going to pay zakat on that because 1500 pound is above the silver this afternoon when you have a mixture of asset you need to compare the total value of everything against the silver this you don't take gold and compare it on its own and you think okay i got less gold than the gold this and then i don't pay zakat however i have more cash than the silver this i pay zakat no you need to combine the value of everything and compare everything against the silver itself. What the lady has said that if somebody has got seven less than seven dollar of gold and they don't need to be zakat, that would be valid if a person has got gold only as assets and they got no cash or nothing. If their gold is below the gold in the sub, then they do not pay zakat. If the gold is below the gold in the sub, then they do not pay zakat. But if they have gold and cash, then you need to combine the value first together and compare it against the silver itself. Yes, brother. What is the silver itself and gold itself like around about today? It is about 244 pounds. That's the silver, yeah? Silver, yeah. 245, roughly around that much. I didn't check it. What about the gold? Gold is about 2,700. This you can go on our website, it changes every day. It's on nzf.org.uk, you can see the value of both this up on the main page. It's around 2,700. Can you, can you... Yes. Water well, can you build a water well for a community that does not have access to water? Again, you need to have transfer of ownership. Building a water well, there's no ownership being given to anybody. So you need to make somebody owner of that water well, and then he allows for the well to be used by anybody. You can't just build a water well like that and then anyone can come and use it. Uh, yes, well. The savings that you have in your account, it has to be a year before you pay. The so you pay zakat on all the cash that you have. Every cash that you have on your zakat day, whether it's in your current account, saving account, it's in your wallet, you're hiding it under your mattress from the tax man or from your wife or something like that, you include all that into your zakat calculation. <laughs> It doesn't have to be that you had that wealth for a period of one year in the Hanafi fiqh. And this is the easiest way to calculate the zakat. To pay zakat on whatever you have on your zakat anniversary date. So if my zakat anniversary date is today, and somebody came and gave me 10,000 pounds yesterday, I have to pay zakat on that 10,000 pounds. Yes, because I entered my zakat day with that 10,000 pounds. What if I told you to come the next day by cheating? If you cheat and that happened, I have heard that. I don't know no, but if I say to you, don't drop it off the day. Yeah, there is people, you don't need to do that. I'm going to tell you what people do. The day before the Zakat day, they say, My dear wife, I love you so much, take everything from me. And then they enter the Zakat anniversary day without anything. And then they go to see Morissa. Morissa, I entered the Zakat day, but 
yesterday I, I decided to make a gift to my wife. Do I need to pay zakat? What do you think what is going to say? He's going to say, don't pay zakat. You can cheat the more of the mufti, whatever, but you can't cheat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you do that purposely, you have something called tax avoidance. If you choose to do zakat avoidance purposely, then that's good in your life. So, Business account, you can't really touch any money in the business account apart from if it's spent on the business itself. So you can't get money, or you can take out a certain amount of dividends after the year, apart from that, you can't really just go withdraw like whatever you want. In France, yeah, well, this is this is in France. I don't know, but in the UK, you can withdraw your money, but it'll be taxed. But we in the UK, what are you talking about France? No, he's got business, he's got business out there. Are you got business in France? Yeah. MashaAllah. Uh, you have to pay zakat. Okay. On your zakat day, you're going to pay zakat on all the cash that you have. All the cash that you have. Whether it's in your personal account or your business account. And all, all the receivables that you have. So if you have sold items, and people they have to pay you back, you have to include the receivable into the zakat calculation. Now, when it comes to the money that is brought into your bank account, I'm talking first about the UK. In the UK, I know that if you do not pay zakat, uh, sorry, if you withdraw the money from your bank account, you're going to be taxed. Even if you're taxed, it doesn't matter. You will not factor in the tax that you have in your bank account. You're going to factor in every single penny you have in your business account. Even if you're going to be taxed if you be the road. How does it work in France? I do not know. I'm from France, but I do not know how that works. But this is the first time I'm hearing this. But I would be, I would be inclined to say that you still have to pay zakat on all the money that you have. Unless it can be demonstrated that you're not allowed to take out the money or something like that. But that is better what you do, yeah? Is you contact us and you explain to me how that works. And then I need to see some documentation and then... Maybe I'm read about it as well. I think, I think the best thing is just to pay it anyway. It's best to pay it. So until you're not sure there's pay on it, and then we can work that out. Yes. Uh, if you are in debt, uh, more than like you are eligible. Like Five more minutes, yeah. Yes. So if you are eligible, you think that I can pay some car, but you and other hand, you are in debt, you have to pay the borrow money for other people. So what like do you have to pay? Still you have to pay the car? I didn't understand that, sorry. Like if you are in debt, uh, okay. yeah, and you think that you got seven dollars, you got the value, it's enough for you. Okay. You have to pay to someone else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you have to pay zakat, mm -hmm. you have to pay the person. First thing is, on your zakat anniversary date, you're going to look at all the cash that you have. And you're going to put everything, all cash, silver, gold, whatever you have. Anything you have in positive, you put it in your asset side. Then you're going to look how much debt you have, how much liabilities you have. You will include only, and you do not have to, you do not have to include it. If you don't have to include it, then don't include it, and pay zakat on whatever you have. But if you want to make a deduction, then you will only include the debt that you're going to repay within the next 12 months, minus the interest. Not every debt. So for example, scenario, I have 10,000 pounds of cash. My first option is to pay zakat on the full 10,000 pounds. My second option is to look at how much of the debt do I have. Okay, I owe my brother 1,000 pounds. I haven't paid the rent, 1,500 pounds, I need to pay it. Now I'm going to ask myself, do I need to pay this debt within the next 12 months or not? If the answer is yes, I include it. If the answer is no, then I will ignore it as if it did not exist. If I have to include it, then I will do 10,000 minus 2.5 grand. 1,000 plus 1,500, 1, that's 2.5k. How much is that? 10,000 minus 2.5. 7,500 7, 7, pounds. Then you pay zakat on that. So, to answer your question is, once you do the calculation, you're going to look at all the money you have and all the debt that you have and that needs to be repaid in the next 12 months. If, after that, you're still in minus. So let's say for example you have 10,000 pounds, but you have 20,000 pounds of debt to repay. 
in the next 12 months. Now, how much is that going to be? Minus 10. Then you do not need to do second. Okay? Yes, brother. If you think that over the years you may not have paid sufficient zakat, should you retrospectively go and pay zakat? You, yes. Okay, Any miss zakat has to be paid before you die. Zakat is a very serious matter. It's never forgiven by saying, you know, I went to Hajj and I don't my toba and Allah is going to forgive me. No. The Hanafi says that when you die, if you think that you have some zakat that is unpaid, then you must leave instruction to the heirs to pay the zakat from your estate. But they won't be able to use more than one third of your estate. After that, the two third needs to be distributed amongst those who is going to inherit. But to show you how serious the matter is, the Shah Rais Hamad is Malik is saying, when you die, if you have some unpaid zakat, whether you left instruction or not, we will take your money, we will make up for any unpaid zakat that there is. If after that there is anything to give to your children, we give it. If there is nothing left, then it's finished. But first we need to pay your zakat. So if you think you have some zakat that has not been paid correctly in the past, and you have something unpaid, then do the calculation, whatever, do an estimation and pay it. Okay? Yes, sir. We have to pay the zakat for the for the first year, whatever it was, from from twenty first of Ramazan till the last twenty first of Ramazan, whatever is in the bank. No. For example, I said you pay zakat whatever you have on the day of zakat. <coughs> yeah, for example. Don't look at what happens before. This month I have ten thousand in my account. Yeah. I have to pay the bill and all those things. You said for the next twelve months. Okay. When I say you need to factor in the next 12 months worth of repayment, I was talking about debts. For example, today is my zakat day, which is the 7th of June. And let's say I haven't paid the rent for the months of May. The debt has occurred prior to my zakat day. That I can deduct it if I'm going to repay that in the next 12 months. The debt must have occurred prior to your zakat day. But if the debt is, hasn't taken place yet, for example, today I thought to myself, oh, but I need to pay the rent for the next six months. That's not debt. That is not debt. I need to pay my membership gym for the next six months. That is not debt. Do you understand? These are costs related to future consumption. That's why you cannot deduct it. So you can't deduct the bills that's going to come in the next 12 months because they haven't come yet. But you can't deduct the bills that is outstanding which you haven't paid prior to your zakat bill. Do you understand all that? Yeah, that's fine. Any other question? So if you so if you've got one house that we live in, yeah? But we've got another house that's worth five hundred grand. Do we pay the card on that other house? It depends on why you bought the other house for. We've got we to rent it, we make money on it. Then you have to understand two things. In Sharia, the business stock. The business stock is something that you bought with the intention of resell. Business stock hasn't got the same definition as we all know it from the accounting perspective. That even the equipment in a shop is part of the business stock. In Sharia, that is not business stock. So if you have a takeaway and you have your uh, the table, the chairs, etc., you don't pay account of these things. These are not business stock. Because you didn't buy them to resell. So if you buy a house, with the intention of resell. It's not, it's not about whether you make money or not. It's why do you buy the house for? If you buy the house with the intention of resell, then you pay zakat on the full value of the house. But if you buy the house with the intention of putting it up on rent, then you do not pay zakat on the value of the house. Because you didn't buy the house for resell. Yes, the rent is zakatable. The cash you're getting, whatever cash you have on your zakat, then you're going to pay zakat on that. But you don't pay zakat on the value of the house. A taxi driver, he buys a car to turn it into a taxi. He didn't buy the car to, to sell the taxi, did he? So he's not going to pay zakat on the taxi. A guy who buys the car to give driving lesson, he's a driving instructor. He's not going to pay zakat on the value of the car. He didn't buy the car to sell the car. So you have to differentiate between the asset 
that you buy to generate an income and those assets that you buy for capital growth, meaning you buy them to sell. You have to differentiate. Same thing with the land. If you buy the land for resale, you pay zakat on it. If you buy the land for development or because you're going to build your house on it or because you don't know what you're going to do with it, then you don't pay zakat on that. Because you don't know what you're going to do with the land. If you don't know what you're going to do with something, you don't pay zakat. Any other question? Don't forget you need to pay zakat on your pension contribution as well if you have a certain type of pension contribution. It's called the Defined Contribution Scheme or Private Pension Scheme. If you have that scheme, you need to make sure you show your compliance first of all, and secondly, you have to pay zakat on it every year. Do you, you pay zakat on what you're receiving from the pension? No, I'm talking about the contribution you make in it every year and every time. The defined contribution scheme or the private pension scheme is something that is zakatable. Why? Even though you do not have access to it, that is still your money, first of all. And secondly, the money is working on your behalf. The money is working on your behalf, meaning there's growth in it because it's invested on your behalf. It's invested. It's not just you putting money inside. It's the money is invested. That's why you need to make sure the investment is sure you're complying.